tonight, as we get ready to dive into God's Word, I want to just pray and uh, even what's on our hearts. I know corporately, one of the things that's on our hearts as a church is uh, student ministries coming back. Um, and uh, so I'm going to pray for even the fruitfulness of this weekend in the, in the hearts and souls of our, of our, our teens, our students. And in light of those last lyrics that we just sang, I want, I want to pray also from the prayer that Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3, where you heard some of those lyrics uh, where they came from that prayer in Ephesians 3. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to pray for uh, student ministries, pray for our time tonight in the Word, and um, just absolutely cut and paste Paul's prayer because it's inspired, <laughs> so I can't improve upon it. And uh, this will be our prayer uh, tonight. Father, thank you so much for another Lord's Day that we get to just worship you, fellowship together, look to your word, minister in your name. Lord, we're also just thankful for a weekend where our teens were able to spend time together in your word. Thank you for uh, Josh Kelso's leadership over these last several years, and thank you for Kyle Frazee, who's been teaching several sermons this, this weekend. And we pray, Lord, that in the hearts of this young generation, we pray that you would raise up young men and young women who would tremble at your word, young men and women who would live for you, who would count the cost, who would stand, and they would stand firm, and they would shine like stars in a crooked and perverse generation as they hold fast to your word. Lord, I pray for this generation because the world that they will face is increasingly hostile. Uh, the, the demise of the culture, even uh, by way of sensitivities, is increasingly, increasingly low. And we pray that uh, this generation would have the privilege of holding forth the light of the gospel to this world. So we pray that you would strengthen them, fortify them, ground them in truth. I pray that uh, this weekend there might be conversions. There might be brokenness and repentance. There might be lights going on of connections to what it means to fear you as Kyle taught out of Proverbs 1 and 2. And I pray that it would produce in the hearts and consciences of these young people a clear path forward with regard to what it means to treasure your commandments, to value your wisdom, and to love fearing you more than life itself. And if they get a hold of that, then they will possess a true fear of you. They will be able to discern right from wrong. They'll be able to avoid every false path. And they will be equipped to shine forth in the midst of this generation. And Lord, as we, attention, as we turn our attention to your word tonight, we just pray that you would indeed glorify your name in us as we long to obey it, as we long to live it. And uh, we want to pray this prayer that Paul prayed 2,000 years ago on behalf of the Ephesians. And for this reason, we bow our knees before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that you would grant to us, according to the riches of your mercy, to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner man, so that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we would be rooted and grounded in love, and we might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, your Son, which surpasses knowledge, that we might be filled up to all the fullness of you. And Lord, to you, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the, your power which works within us, to you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Tonight I want to direct your attention to a topic that I am sure is relevant for all of us, and that is the topic of contentment. Contentment is something that is a... Uh, a uh, perpetual battle. It's a perpetual challenge. If uh, we find our significance, our contentment, our joy in anything but the Lord, uh, we will find that contentment is elusive and impossible to hang on to. I have three definitions 
from just three secular dictionaries. Here's, here's one, a t- definition for the word contentment. A state of happiness and satisfaction. Second one, satisfaction with what one has. And then the third, very similar to the second, satisfaction with one's possessions, status, or situation. And, you know, we know that uh, contentment and discontentment are good and bad, respectively. I don't have to tell you that. You didn't drive here tonight to find out that contentment is good and discontentment is bad. We knew that before we got here. And it really requires no defense. I've never read a theological defense for the virtues of discontentment and complaining against God's providence, um, fortunately. However, why contentment is so good and why discontentment is so bad may not be as obvious. And so this is um, kind of a, some thoughts that I've had in, in, the, in the years past as I've thought about the theology behind contentment. Why is contentment so good and discontentment so bad? And there's a theology behind our contentment uh, that would be a foundation even before whatever we would talk about practically by way of pursuing a contentment in the Lord. And so I've given this to you in, in an outline, uh, and you'll see that on the PowerPoint. The theology of contentment starts with the fact that contentment is a command. Contentment is a command. So God gives us the obligation to be content. If we are not content, we're sinning. That's about as simple as I can say it. If we are not content in the Lord, we are sinning. Contentment is an obligation. It's a privilege. It's a duty. It's a mandate. It's an imperative. We must be content. You can see this in some passages in the scriptures. Some actually word it as an imperative, a command that gives us the obligation to be content. Others simply describe it as a virtue and expect that it would be true of true Christians. Let's look at a few of these. Uh, Let's start in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 5. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, I'll never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Now, in this verse, um, the author doesn't necessarily say, be content as an imperative, but he does say, you must be content by way of this participle that tells us how to obey the command to make sure that our character is free from the love of money. It's obligatory that our character is not loving money. And the means of how you do that is by being content with what you have. So the being content aspect of this verse is really just as obligatory as the direct command, which is make sure that your character is free from the love of money. And the way you do that is by being content with what you have. And I think that principle is even connected not only just to the issue of money, but even to verse 4, to the issue of purity. Marriage is to be held in honor by all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. And so both with impurity and with love of money, those would be the outflow, those would be the symptom of a character that is not content with what you have. So contentment is obligatory if you're going to obey these commands. You can't obey these commands without contentment, either verse 4 or verse 5. Let's look at another example. Go back a couple books here to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And you'll remember that here we find out how how contentment is an expectation. Paul expects that the Christian would be content. So again, this one's not a direct command. And let's pick it up in chapter 6, verse verse 6. Godliness is actually a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And the contrast here is with false teachers in verse 5, who ends in verse 5 by saying, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So there are, there are people in the church, Paul's telling Timothy, who are going to use religion and the church even as a means of making money, of getting rich, of getting, increasing their own resources. And then he turns the corner to say, but honestly, godliness is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment. Now, what could be greater than to have a relationship with God and to be content with God and need nothing else for your satisfaction? 
And so he says in verse 8, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get to rich, and fa- uh, they fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Here, Paul is making it very clear, we must be content with what God gives us. We should be content with whatever he provides for us. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Let's look at two more examples. Look at Luke chapter 3. You remember that famous passage where uh, Jesus and John the Baptist are preaching repentance? People are coming to him and asking what repentance looks like. And Jesus is giving them very specific instructions. And so this is kind of a a practical outworking of what it looks like to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. People are coming to Jesus and they're saying, well, what does it look like for me to repent? And they've got various walks of life. Uh, For instance, you've got tax collectors, you've got soldiers, and they're coming and asking, what does it look like to be content in my my circumstance? Um, In verse 10, the crowds were questioning him, saying, what shall we do um, as a result of his preaching? And he would say to them, um, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors who, who also came to be baptized, they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you've been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. And so in that era, you know, the soldier has authority. They have a civil authority, and they could even use their civil authority to basically steal because who's going to hold them accountable? They are the militia, and so they could use their, abuse their authority and take what was not theirs. And he's saying, be content with your pay, and that's actually a command. That would be a fruit in keeping with repentance is to be content with whatever God's provided for them through their Salary, their wage, whatever they were contracted for to serve as a soldier for the the Roman army. And so there is obviously a command. Uh, The final one I'm going to show you is in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and this is kind of the go-to passage, probably one of the most familiar and probably the one that came to mind when I first mentioned we're going to look at a few passages that give us a a picture of contentment. Um, In fact, it's this passage where Jeremiah Burroughs got the title for his famous book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, because in verse um, 12, he says, I've learned the secret. And the, contents, the context is that this is the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. So let's pick it up in chapter 4, verse um, 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Just, you know, if we had time to walk through the whole epistle, what he's saying here is um, they've always cared for Paul, but now most recently with some financial distress and hardship, they've raised some funds because the opportunity was there where they realized, man, we can get Paul some funds and he needs them for the ministry. And he's thanking them for their very generous gift. He alludes to it at the beginning of the letter. He's explicit about it later in chapter four. And that's what he's talking about here. It's not that they haven't cared for him, but lacking the opportunity means they didn't have the resources. Paul didn't necessarily need the resources. Now it's the opportune time. They send some money to Paul, and he's thanking them for that gift. Verse 11, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. In that word content, you can see the the NAS, if you're reading the NAS, the footnote there says, or self-sufficient. It's literally a word that would mean um, sufficient in and of oneself, or the circumstances are everything that you could need. It's it's enough. It's self-sustaining. It's, I don't need any more. And so he's saying, I've learned what it means to be content or self-sufficient in any circumstance. Verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so that verse now, you know, becomes kind of abused. Uh, I I tried it. I tried it just, you know, to to, to bat a hundred and to dunk from the three-point line. And I've used that. I've, I've, I've appealed to that verse for all sorts of things that never came true. 
But the verse is very clear. In the context, I can do all things through Christ means the only possible way that I could be content in any and every circumstance is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to do everything through Christ. I can do all things. I can be content with much, with little, with nothing. In any spectrum, I can find my contentment because the secret is Christ. And so the self-sufficiency of Paul is not a personal self-sufficiency. It's a self-sufficiency in whatever sovereign providence has ordained for him. And so when sovereign providence takes away those resources, he finds his contentment in God. And so when a circumstance where there's less, he's content. When there's more, he's content. His contentment is God. His contentment does not ride on the tracks of circumstance. It's as steady as the character of his God. And so contentment is a command. It's a command. It's an expectation. It's an obligation. It's a virtue. Now, we're going to start moving into the theology of contentment here. If this is what it looks like, then what's the theology of it? And and I I was super encouraged to just think about the, the simple starting point, that contentment is a command, and that means a lot. Because God commands things. Um, have you ever thought about this? Why does God command things? Why does he command what he commands? What, what motivates his commanding? Does he just throw out commands because he likes to make things really, really challenging? It just makes some crazy commands that somebody can't obey on their own. Is it just an arbitrary difficulty? How about, how about contentment? And then I'll put them in difficult circumstances <laughs> and see, how, see if they can even obey that command. Is that, God's, is that the heart of God? Absolutely not. The heart of God, when he makes a command, he's actually so righteously and so holy in his motivations. He is motivated by what is best for us, and he's motivated by what is most glorious for him. Every single time God gives forth a righteous standard, that righteous standard is a direct reflection of his character. So let's move to number two here on this theology of contentment. God's commands reflect his character. God commands what reflects his own virtue, his own righteousness, his own character. So this is not an arbitrary command. He's not just picking standards that are beyond us just out of sheer boredom of let's just make this so ridiculous. And then they look at the standard and say, I can't do it. He's actually saying, no, that's actually the right standard. That is the perfect standard. You should be content in me because I'm content in me. That's the theology of contentment. Let's see that in the scriptures. First of all, let's just talk about the law. The law, God's law in general. Before we look at specific commands, how about the law in its entirety? Let's start in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42. And this is an an important verse. Uh, This is one of those verses that have... I've leapt off the page to me because of its implications. Uh, Isaiah 42, verse 21. And as I read this verse, I want you to think about what's the purpose behind God's heart when he gives his law, when he gives us his standards, and the revelation of what? What's he revealing here? Verse 21. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake, for the sake of his own righteousness, for the sake of his own perfections, his own upright character. He was pleased for that purpose to make the law great and glorious. You think about the implications there. I mean, it's true. The standard of God's righteousness is beyond our ability naturally to obey and that's totally appropriate because that's why we have, we have to look to the Lord. We've got to get outside of ourselves. We need help. Otherwise, we wouldn't need salvation. But it's not an arbitrary difficulty. Um, you know, if you, if you watch uh, the Olympics, you know, some of the sports, or like think of, like think of high jump. You know, if the, if the high jump has a starting height 
you know, that kind of just whittles out people who've never even done it before, right? You know, starting height. So if somebody just gets up there, I've never tried this before. Let me just go ahead and try the starting height. Uh, you know, at the world-class level, no one's going to clear it. Only world-class athletes are going to start there. And then they kind of work their way up and they uh, re- limit the crowd. So imagine if we uh, picked a starting height and we just said, okay, today the starting height for the high jump is mm, 10 feet. A couple feet over the world record. <laughs> 10 feet. That's impossible. Okay, not 10 feet. 100 feet. You'd say, what's the difference? 10 feet's impossible. 100 feet's impossible. Let's just make it arbitrarily high for no reason whatsoever. God's law is not like that. God's law is infinitely above and beyond us, but it's not arbitrarily high. It's actually the accurate, the perfectly accurate representation of his character. God is as righteous as he demands in his law. The law reflects his perfections, his character. And so for the sake of his own righteousness, it was pleasing to the Lord to make the law great and glorious. Because the righteous law reveals his righteousness. There's another verse that kind of highlights some of the profound, limitless nature of God's standards. Psalm, and you don't have to turn to all of these. I'm going to jump around here for a bit, pretty quickly, actually. But you can turn here if you want to. Psalm 119, verse 96. The psalmist says, I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. And it's an interesting verse because it's almost like there's an implicit logic here saying there's a limit to all perfection. If you looked at anything in the world and you said, how how perfect is it? There's a limit to everything. And then all of a sudden he says, now let's talk about God's commandment. It is exceedingly broad. And it's as though he's to say, here's the one category that, that breaks the rule. There is a depth and breadth and a perfection to God's law that is limitless. There's no limit to God's, God's law. It's, it's perfect, perfection. It's infinitely perfect. So God's law is great and holy, infinitely perfect, because God is great and holy and infinitely perfect. It's his righteous law because it's a display of his righteous character. He's revealing his perfections even when he gives commands. Now, let's look at some specifics. That's the law in general. Is that true of specific commands? Absolutely. How about forgiveness? What's the standard, the comparison to the command to forgive? Well, let's just look at two Quick and simple examples. Let's start in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Remember this? A command to forgive one another. Notice what it's rooted in. The command for us to forgive one another is rooted in the character of God who has also forgiven us. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So you forgive one another just as God forgave you. Look at Colossians 3.12. Colossians 3.12, Paul writes this. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone... Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. God is a forgiving God, so you should be forgiving. Forgive because God forgives. He forgives, so you should forgive. I mean, you can see the corollary here. It's a, it's a comparison. This is God's character on display, so his commands flow out of his character. I forgave, I forgive people, you should forgive people. How about love? Yes and yes and yes. Our love for one another is rooted in God's love for us. Listen to John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We're supposed to love one another because God loves us and loved us. So you do the same. God loves us, so therefore you get busy loving one another. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. How about this one? Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Now that one is sweet because it just kind of takes everything we've said about the law in its entirety and 
Everything about God's law reflects God's character. And in the specificity of God's love, he tells us to love. And so Paul can actually say, yeah, love, love your neighbor and fulfill that obligation. Because if you do that, you'll obey the law. You'll fulfill the law. And then we could read a bunch of passages. First Thess 4, 9, for, uh, excuse me, First Thess 4, 9, 1 John 3, 23, and 4, 7, and 4, 11. And they all say the same thing. How about one more example? How about the command to be holy? Be holy. Why be holy? Eh, just because. No reason in particular. Of course there's a reason. <laughs> be holy because I am holy, God says. The command to be holy is rooted in his holy character. It's rooted in his holiness. Remember 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16? But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I'm obligated to be holy because God's holy. God is so holy that he says, look, I'm holy, and that is glorious, and it's a virtue. And because I want you to glorify me, and because I want you to have the blessing of being holy, you must be holy. And the command flows out of his character. And that's the same in Leviticus 11.44, 19.2, 20 verse 7. I mean, it's all over the scripture. So there's, there's three examples, just forgiveness, love, and be holy. Those commands are all rooted in who God is. We're commanded to be like God because number one, that glorifies him. Number two, that's the best thing for us. And so in our little theology of contentment, number one, contentment is a command. Number two, God's commands reflect his character. And that leads us to number three. Therefore, be content because God is. The theology of contentment is that we must be content because God is content. Our contentment is rooted in God's contentment. God is unbelievably content. He's never known a moment of discontent. He's completely content in who he is. He's completely content in what he does. He's perfect in his essence and his character. And everything he does is perfect. All of his works are perfect, unreproachable. I'm going to read a few examples of some theologies here. And these are helpful, helpful articulations of, of God's character. One of, the, one of the doctrines of God's character would be his aseity. A seity is a fancy term that just kind of has to do with an independent, autonomous self-existence. He doesn't get his existence from anyone else. He doesn't get his existence from anything else. He's not, he doesn't have a derived existence. He is autonomous in his own existence. He has always existed, and his existence doesn't depend on anything outside of himself. He has a seity. And so, understandably, Herman Bavink treats aseity as the first among all the attributes of God. In his, um, in his book, The Reformed Dogmatics, he uses the term um, independence here as well. And so he, he goes back and forth. You'll see the word independent and aseity, both of those words, and he kind of uses them somewhat simil, uh, synonymously here. And here's what Herman Bavink said. He said, God is independent, all sufficient in himself, the only source of all existence in life. Yahweh is the name that describes this essence and identity most clearly. I will be what I will be. It is this aseity of God conceived not only as having being from himself, but also as the fullness of being that all other divine perfections are included. And so he's making the point here, God's existence isn't derived, he just is who he is, and he, has, he just doesn't, he doesn't require anything, and then his perfections flow out of his aseity, so he's not achieving anything, he's not improving, he's not getting better, he just is as perfect as he is, timelessly. And so he goes on to say, this is still uh, Herman Bavink, now this independence of God is more or less recognized by all humans. 
Pagans, to be sure, degrade the divine by drawing it down to the level of the creature and teach a a theogony, and then I put an explanation in there. That's a genealogy or a group. It's a, a group or a system of gods. However, behind and above their gods, they often again assume the existence of a power to which everything is subject in an absolute sense. Many of them speak of nature, chance, fate, or fortune as a power superior to all else. And philosophers tend to speak of God as the absolute. In Christian theology, this attribute of God was called his independence, a seity, all-sufficiency, greatness. In the East, a number of terms were used. Um, God, without beginning or cause, unbegotten. And theologians preferably spoke of God as self-divine, self-luminous, self-wise, self-virtuous, self-excellent, and so on. All that God is, he is of himself. And that's a, a lot of words, but you get the point. It makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? I mean, he is absolutely autonomous, his existence completely underived, independent of anyone and anything else. All existence comes from him. A couple more. William Edgar says this, Aseity comes from the Latin ase, meaning from himself. It means God is self-sufficient, dependent on nothing. He determines all things. As the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. And then finally, John Frame writes, Theologians have usually treated aseity as a metaphysical attribute, that is, one that focuses on the independence of God's being over against other beings. It seems to me, however, that the same basic concept is equally important in the epistemological and ethical areas. That is to say, God's not only self-existent, but also self-attesting and self-justifying. So what he's saying is he is self-attesting. The only way you could know God is for him to make himself known. Not only does he exist without receiving existence from something else, he gains his knowledge also from himself, his nature and his plan. And he serves as his own criterion of truth. And his righteousness is self-justifying based on the righteousness of his own nature and on his status as the ultimate criterion for righteousness. Now, that's a, that's a powerful statement because what John Frame is saying is he, he has a seity. He has this existence that's not derived on anyone or anything. And then all perfections inside of him define everything. What's true? What's God? That's what's true. What's righteous? What's God? That's what's righteous. His existence defines everything. Let's look at the scriptures. As we turn to the scriptures, I'm just going to give you a a conclusion up front. God is eternally happy in himself. He is totally self-sufficient. He needs nothing from his creation. He has no lack that would even need to be filled. And so therefore, God is the infinitely content God. Let's start in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, I know we're bouncing around, um, and I think occasionally it's just helpful to kind of pick a topic like this and just start tracing it through Scripture. So that, you know, as we're doing this theology of contentment, you know, I, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a uh, help to this. Um, but granted, uh, your fingers might be getting a little tired of flipping pages here. We're going to keep looking at a few texts. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. Paul tells Timothy that his gospel is, or that his message is according to the gospel, or specifically the sound teaching, is according to the glorious gospel, the glorious good news, the glorious proclamation or announcement of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Blessed. And I can use the word happy. Happy is a great word. But it does need to be a little bit redeemed because in our culture, happy can quickly and easily have a connotation of kind of being glib, lighthearted, carefree. That's not the, 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 the aspect of happiness. But happiness, so far as it means blessed and spiritually fortunate, God is infinitely blessed, infinitely fortunate. He has all. He owns all. He rules all. He has no lack. He is the blessed God. 
Chapter 6, verse 15. Stay in 1 Timothy. Chapter 6, verse 15. Look at this. Paul then concludes by calling him the blessed God once again. Um, verse 14, keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, he is infinitely blessed. He is infinitely happy, spiritually fortunate. He is infinitely content. He's the only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And of course, that um, has a Davidic and Messianic um, flavor to it. God the Father is infinitely blessed. God the Son is infinitely blessed. Now let's go back to the Psalms. Flip over to Psalm 50 and notice what, the, what God says of himself here in Psalm 50. And in case you ever were wondering if God needed anything, if he lacks any contentment, Psalm 50 slams the door on that question. It's a resounding no. Pick it up in verse 7. Psalm 50, verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am, I am God, your God. I do, not, I do not reprove you for your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. And he's just reminding them, look, you've come and you've offered sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. It's like Amos 5, where the prophet Amos rebukes the nation. Why, who is this that's trampling my courts? You keep coming back here, doing this same routine, this religious routine, and your hearts are far from me. I'm just sick of it. And here he's saying, look, you come to me with these sacrifices as if I needed the animal, as if I needed something. Don't I own all of it? Don't I own the cattle on a thousand hills? Verse 12, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. The world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. The only way you can honor a God who is infinitely content is through your lack. It's through your need. That's the only way you can give honor to a God who has everything. It's through your need and your lack. And so coming to him empty-handed, broken with spiritual need, he can fill that need and glorify his infinite contentment and his infinite resource, and his aseity. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to tell, tell me of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him. There's a congenial approval of crime and of wickedness that they also perpetrate, or at least that they love the thought of, even if they don't act on it externally. And you associate with adulterers, You let your mouth loose in evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. Watch this. You thought that I was just like you. Isn't that the way it always goes with idolatry? We create, God created us in in his image, and then in our sin, we would create a God in our image. And whenever we create a God, he's always discontent. He's always angry about something. He's throwing a temper tantrum about something. We need to appease him. He's got some lack that we can try to fulfill. And we can try to boost his, his significance in the universe by showing that our God's better and then trying to boost him up, fill him up, do something for him. I'm not the God of the scriptures. He has no lack. He has no need. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Let's look at the New Testament parallel to Psalm 50. That's found in Acts 17. Remember what Paul said on Mars Hill? Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. Here's a a theology of 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 an eternally content God. God is content. This verse shows us how content he really is. Verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not dwell in temples made with human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. I mean, this is the God who has everything. What do you give the God who has everything? He's not served by us. He's not benefited by us. He has no lack. He has no need. The whole religion of worship in Mars Hill was driven by a theology of a God who actually had lack, who had need. And then the worship filled that up. And Paul's sitting here declaring, no, you don't have the right God. Let me declare to you the God that you're actually ignorant of, the one true God. He's the God who's not served by you. He's a God who's infinitely content. And he has everything. And in fact, not only does he have everything, he gives everyone else everything that they have. And not only that, he gives everything else its existence. Everything is from him. We could continue down this track. I'll give you a list of passages that are worthy of reading in this context of what we're describing here. Exodus 19.5 describes all the earth is mine. Deuteronomy 10.14 Uh, The heavens and the earth and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it belongs to the Lord our God. 1 Chronicles 29, 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Everything that's in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. That's a sweet verse. Job 41, 11, God himself says, who has given to me that I should repay him? Who has God ever been indebted to? No one. Psalm 82, verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possess all the nations. 89, 11. The heavens are yours. The earth does also. The world and all it contains. You have founded uh, founded them. Excuse me. These texts show that God possesses and owns and has everything. Maybe, maybe, perhaps you might be thinking there's some wiggle room in theology for some discontentment. Maybe you might think, well, sure, after all, I can understand why God is infinitely content because he has everything. I don't. That's the difference. Oh, okay. Now we're getting to the theology of contentment, aren't we? Is it fair that God is content when he has everything? Aren't we entitled to some discontent because we don't have everything? Well, let's think about this. God is self-sufficient and content, not only just with everything he has and possesses, but also with everything that would pertain to what you have and what you don't have. Here's the theology behind Philippians 4. How is Paul able to say, my contentment doesn't waver when I have and when I don't have? Paul is absolutely content with God's contentment pertaining to every aspect of God's perfection and character that would affect his life. Let me just pick a few of these attributes. First of all, God's wisdom. God is infinitely wise, and he's ordained this universe. And I think you all understand that, and I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'll be quick on this. Let's just look at um, uh, a couple examples. Look at Isaiah 40 for a second. Isaiah 40. Verse 12, God says this through the prophet Isaiah, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him with whom did he consult? Who gave him understanding? Who taught him the path of justice and who taught him knowledge and informed him in the way of understanding? What has God ever learned? Nothing. Nothing. He has no lack in his wisdom. So we're taking that same theology. He has no lack in general. Well, he has no lack in his wisdom. He's never needed assistance. He's never needed advice. He's never sought out a counselor. He's never even learned anything. He is infinitely wise. And so that's critical 
for having a theology of contentment, under starting with just the fact that God is infinitely wise and his wisdom is unimprovable. Well, what about, what if God is, let's just grant that God's wise and he's infinitely wise. And so I get it. He's content with his wisdom and we should be content with his wisdom too. But what if his goal is all wrong? What's he, what's he aiming at in this universe? He must be aiming at something that doesn't line up with my goal for my life in this universe. Because guess what? If he's content in his wisdom, I can be content in that too. But if his goal is wrong, I think that's where I start seeing my, my discontentment creeping in. What's God's goal? I'll give you two verses. Isaiah 48, 11. Isaiah 48, 11. It's very clear. In no uncertain terms, we see why God does everything that he does. Verse 11 says, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. Why does God act? For his own benefit, for his own advantage, for his own gain, for his own glory. Why does God do everything for his own benefit and his own glory? He answers that in the very next verse. I'm sorry, very next phrase in the same verse. Four. So that word for, you could think of it as a because. This is a reason why Isaiah could, say, could quote God for saying that. God says, here's the truth. I only act for my own glory. Why, God? Because, he says, because... How can my name be profaned? And my glory, I will not give to another. God's goal in the universe is his own glory. Why? Because he's not an idolater. He's never been guilty of idolatry. That's why he does it that way. His goal is perfect. His goal is unimprovable for governing this universe. It's for his glory. Let's look at one more example. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 it explains the God glorifying focus of all that he does. And Paul just erupts in worship and praise in this doxology. Romans 11 verses 33 to 36. Paul writes, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? There's Isaiah 40 again. Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. Everything originated from him. Everything comes into play through and by means of him. And everything is ultimately directed back to him. He's the source, the means, the end. It's all about, excuse me, about God and his glory. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Eternal, infinite glory goes to God. God's content with his wisdom. God's content with his goal. Yeah, but you know what? I think the wiggle room for my discontentment comes from, okay, he's wise. He's got a good goal, but I think, I think how he gets there sometimes. I think the plan. I think the plan includes some things in my life that it doesn't need to include. Now, of course, we never think that, but when we see the fruit of discontentment, we know that we ultimately believe that. What about God's plan? God is still self-sufficient and content when it comes to his own plan, his own counsel, his own path to bringing everything wisely to his own glory in this universe. Let me give you a few examples. Psalm 115 verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. God is thrilled with his plan. Psalm 135, verse 5. I know that the Lord is great and the, our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in the heavens and the earth and the sea and all the deeps. God does whatever he pleases. How about Ephesians 1.11? We have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose. Remember, the word purpose is singular. There's only one purpose who works all things after the counsel. Remember, the word counsel is singular. There's only one counsel. 
after the counsel of his will. Will is singular. There's only one will. He's not deliberating among 10 decently good options, and occasionally his sovereignty falls into track nine. Eh, well, there's eight, eight other options that would have been better, but nine's not, nine's not too bad. No, there's one singular plan, one singular counsel, one singular purpose, and it is perfect and unimprovable. So if God's content and self-sufficient when it comes to his wisdom, his goal, and his plan, about all that's left is his power. Is God powerful enough to bring this to fruition? Of course. God's self-sufficient and content with his own power to accomplish his will and to carry out wisely all of the ordained universe to the goal of his glory. Isaiah 40, 14, 27 says, For the Lord of hosts has planned it. Who can frustrate it? And as for his outstretched hand, who can turn it back? Psalm 103, verse 19, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. There is nothing that can turn God's hand back. There's nothing that can um, overpower him or dissuade him or change his mind or ever prevent him from carrying out with power and omnipotence whatever he has deemed best according to his infinite wisdom. So at this point, if the point of the, in this theology of contentment is be content because God is content, the question might come to mind, well then, if God's so content, why did he create? Well, that's a good question. It points to the unanswerable problem of every other theology save the Christian trinity. You know, think about this. Among the monotheisms of the world, only Christianity has the uh, ability to answer um, why, the ability of God to be content um, before creation. You ever thought about that? Before creation, God was infinitely content with the fellowship that he enjoyed among three divine persons. And out of that Trinitarian relationship flows everything that exists. He was content in who he is. One God existing as three distinct persons. The fellowship and the contentment in eternity past was real. And you think about how the, the problems this poses, it's kind of helpful to even think about how unique the, content, the, uh, the contentment of the biblical God really is. You understand in, in, um, in Islam, Allah can never change. But Allah is a monopersonal God. There's only one God and there's only one person. Allah. And so who did he love before he created? Well, how did he start loving at some point in time? Whoops. Only the biblical God is infinitely content. And you see that on display in interactions and transactions between the Father and the Son. Listen to Matthew 3, 17. Behold, a voice uh, out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 12, 18. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Chapter 17, verse 5. While he was standing and still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God is pleased with the Son, the Son is pleased with the Father, the Spirit is pleased with the Father and the Son, and He has enjoyed infinite perfection and contentment relationally from eternity past. So, if He's so content, then, then why did He create? Well, he, he created to put His glory on display. It wasn't out of lack that God created, it was out of overflow. Jonathan Edwards said, it's no sign of a fountain's weakness that it overflows. And so God's infinitely content um, essence overflowed and created. According to Isaiah 42, 6 and 7, he created Israel for his glory. According to Romans 9, 22 and 23, he created vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy for his own glory. It just overflowed. And he wanted to put his glory on display. The last question I want to ask before we bring it to the close here. 
How does this theology help me when there's, a, there's this major difference? I've already alluded to this. There's a major difference between my contentment and God's contentment. Namely, God's content because he gets to do what he wants to. Hmm. This contains the answer itself. Whenever I'm not content and happen to live in God's universe, a God who is infinitely content, He's content in everything that he is. He's content in his wisdom. He's content in his plan. He's content in his um, path to achieve the goal of that plan. And he's content in his power to carry out that plan. And I happen to live in his universe. If I live in his universe and I'm not content, then I reveal that my want to, I believe that my want to is better than God's want to. How arrogant and naive. You start to see how arrogant and pride discontentment really is imagine here i am speck of dust in god's universe let alone a sinful speck of dust even if we left sin out of it the puniness of our own desires even if they were all pure even if they were all pure to imagine that i know better than god what a good day would look like this is what today should have been absurd Absurd. This is what leads us to our last point, and this is why contentment or discontentment advertises either a truth or a lie about God's character. Christian, think about this. Your discontentment broadcasts a lie about God's character to a watching Tempe and Phoenix. Christian, think about this. Your contentment broadcasts the truth of God's character to a watching Tempe. And Phoenix. Your contentedness shows what you believe about God. Contentment proclaims God's character, and discontentment smears God's character. Think about this. If you're content, you are preaching to a world that my God knows what he's doing. He's in control, and it's unimprovable. It couldn't be better. And even if, I wouldn't, if it wasn't what I chose, well, then my choosing and my want to are wrong, and what he actually chose is better for his glory and for my spiritual welfare. That's what contentment advertises. This is what Paul modeled for us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. He's learned the secret of contentment regardless of circumstance. Because he understands how all of those circumstances relate back to this kind of theology. Self-sufficiency is not quite the term, but perhaps self-contentedness would be. Paul, in other words, he's using that word self-contentedness in a way that is dependent on God's self-sufficiency. His self-contentedness has to do with the fact that God is content in himself, and so whatever he has, he's okay with, theologically, because he knows God's okay with it. Paul is clearly viewing this self-contentedness as a, as a satisfaction with whatever he has, because this is what the Lord was pleased to give him. In other words, contentment comes from being content with what God is content, content with. Poor? Prosperity? Hungry? Full? Exhausted? Well-rested? Is that what God has deemed? That's what's best. Discontentment reveals, I don't like what God is pleased with. Mm. That's a mouthful. If we are discontent, we're telling the world a, a lie. And it's a blasphemous lie because it's about the God that we love and serve. Discontentment would, would tell the world and it would tell even fellow Christians something like this. We would never say these things. We would never even articulate them in our minds. It would just pain us to even write this in a journal. But this would be what is advertised by discontentment in our own lives. God relied on his own wisdom and he was a fool to do so. Oof. God was content with his own power, but was too weak to accomplish what he was supposed to. Mm. God's will was misguided. Mm. God is wrong to be satisfied or content with himself. The current situation proves that he should have sought my advice, desires, or abilities. There was a uh, moment in our life where 
any um, dad is going to be tested with contentment, and that's when mom leaves on a trip. Mom went to um, California, and this is a few years ago. She, uh, she left to go visit family in L.A. We, we were living in southern, south, southern Florida, and um, chaos always uh, ensues when mom leaves. You know, when mom leaves, it's just like, if the boys survive the trip, it's a success. I mean, if there are four boys who can be at the jetway to pick mom up, it was a success. That's all we're aiming for. We set the bar really low when mom leaves. And so I was aware of, um, you know, I need, I'm going to need some extra discipline. Um, I was, I had, it was a busy week for me um, with, with some responsibilities and, and ministry and courses and stuff that I was teaching. And so I was looking ahead to my week and trying to figure out how am I going to get all this done and get all these kids taken care of and do all this stuff. And we even employed help from ladies in the church who were going to kind of help with kids and schooling and sports and meals and all this other stuff. And I mean, this is like, a, it's like it takes an army to replace April. And that was clear on this particular week. On Monday night, Owen uh, borrowed my keys to go to, into the vehicle in the driveway to try to find a, his splint. He, was, uh, he had, he had a, a stress fracture or something. He was playing football. And uh, so he's looking for his splint. He came back in empty-handed, couldn't find his splint, puts the keys on the bar in the kitchen. The following morning, I can't find my keys anywhere. I had an early morning, 6 o'clock meeting, had to skip it, had to cancel. And um, there was a lady in the church was coming to get the kids. And so I have no ability to do anything. She comes and basically picks up the kids and me. And so then we were all like going all over the place, dropping kids off at school. And she's gonna, she was going to take me over to the, the church so I could get going on my, on, my, uh, on my day, you know, a couple hours later than expected. So we come back. Um, in the middle of the day for lunch, and uh, I came back to get some to see the kids and see how they're doing. Um, we start looking for the keys, and uh, I'm looking, you know, through laundry. Is it in yesterday's laundry? Is it in the kitchen? We're trying. We're turning over everything in the house, everything in any of the rooms where where it could possibly be. And I'm I'm sitting there. I'm kind of I kind of get nervous because I, I realized that, that afternoon I had some more meetings at church, and uh, I had to borrow the lady who was helping us that particular day. I had to borrow her car just so I could go to some of my responsibilities. And so then I finally uh, finished up my responsibilities. Um, I, I I came back home. Uh, this lady needed her car back, so she says, "Okay, I'll drop off the kids at sports, and uh, and I can even take you where you need to go next." So I'm literally doing a counseling appointment on my cell phone in the back seat with five people in the car. This is just incredibly uh, opportune a time to shepherd, and um, the lady drops and finally gets everybody where they need to go. She drops me off at home, and. Um, she actually brings over food. It was just like one of those moments where you're like, oh, God bless you. She brought, home, brought over some Chipotle. Okay, the boys are going to survive. I'm going to survive. Okay, I think we can make it. And I remember that night uh, thinking, okay, we need, to, we need to find these keys ASAP. And as soon as we start, as she brought the food, she leaves. And I'm thinking, okay, we're going to eat. And I realized, oh, I missed picking up my son from football practice. We load the kids into the car. We go over, pick up my son from football practice. We come home. And you know how Chipotle has like the, the foil wrap or the metal lid on top of the, at least they used to, you don't have that metal lid. I'm thinking that's pretty bulletproof. No, not when you got a dog like ours. It ate through the metal lid to get the to Chipotle. So the dog had a really nice meal that night. So I came home and I'm sitting there like, oh my goodness, there goes dinner for us, dinner for the boys. So at 7.30, we finally have all the boys home. We're all hungry. But the next morning, I had an important meeting. I needed my keys. So we start going through the trash one bag at a time. We're out on the, side, on the sidewalk. We have the, you know, the trash is coming the next day. And I thought, well, before the trash truck comes, we've got to make sure it's not in here. I think, I think it's in, I got thrown away somehow. I got thrown in. And it had been a rough week. Before April had flown out, she had some friends over who were, she was discipling some girls who still have kids in diapers. That was a nice pl- treasure and blessing for me. There were sweepings from haircuts and rotten meat and fruit. And at least there was plenty of junk mail to soak up that syrupy mess at the bottom of the trash can. So I was really grateful for that as we dug through it all by hand. Meanwhile, my son Micah is holding the flashlight as we're going through this, you know, at 7.30 at night, piece by piece, each one bag at a time. He's just standing there holding the flashlight. And the whole time he keeps saying, this smells so nasty. This smells so nasty. 
this smells so nasty. That's all he could say. And I'm just sitting there thinking, okay, thank you, Micah. <laughs> so I send the boys in looking through the rooms. They're overturning the living room. They're overturning their bedrooms. We finish the trash bags, Micah and I do, and no, no keys. We put it all back in the trash can. We go inside and wash thoroughly. And I'm just sitting there thinking, this is unbelievable. Finally, after 30 minutes of looking through the house and looking through all the rooms, looking through all the trash, there's no keys, and it's time for bed. I'm putting the boys in bed, and I notice Micah looking across the living room with that look in his eye, that look on his face that just says, I know where the keys are. And I should tell you that I had asked him, this is kind of a fun game he likes to play, to hide something. I had asked him probably four times that day, Micah, did you hide the keys? Do you know where they're at? No, no, no. And he's got that look on his face, and he's looking over toward the piano. So I look over at the piano, I don't see him on the piano. I look back at him, he's still got that look on his face. I'm like, do you know where the keys are? And he said, yeah, I know where they are. And he's looking right at the wall. So I look over at the piano, look up on the wall, and there's a little hook, a little ornamental hook thing, and it's just hanging right there on the hook, this set of keys, right there, in plain sight. I said, Micah, what were you thinking the entire time we were looking for the keys, especially when we were going through the trash, and you had the flashlight, and you said, this stinks, it smells horrible. What were you thinking that entire time? He said, I was thinking, they're not here, Dad. (laughs) And so at that point, I would just like to brag and say, I said, bless you, my son. God was content to leave you mute at that period and that moment, and I bless God for that providence. And I just rejoiced, and I was so content at the entire ordeal. Obviously, the uh, discontentment in my heart was uh, revealing something. And it's just interesting how, you know, God will bring circumstances into your life that are going to expose your theology. And I think this theology that you've seen tonight has to ground your convictions. It has to drive what you believe and how you interpret your life. And when you believe that, you'll be content. Psalm 27, 4 says, One thing I've asked from the Lord, and this is I shall seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. That's all all David wanted. Was to dwell with God, to live with him. Psalm 73, Asaph said, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. And tonight, I'm going to just pray Psalm 86, 4 for us. David writes, Make glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And when we lift up our soul to the Lord, and we're content with him, we'll be content with whatever he's content with. Your contentment is bulletproof if you're content with God because there's nothing that can happen in this universe he's not content with. It's just a pretty profound reality. And so let's pray that that becomes our theology. Lord, make glad the souls of your servants who are here tonight. Make glad your souls of all who are at GBC because to you, O oh Lord, we lift up our soul. We acknowledge that we are so prone and so quickly can look to other things that we think would satisfy other things that we think would glorify you and would honor you. And we don't know, we, we, we don't know what would glorify you any better than what you know. You've told us what would glorify you to some degree. And then the secret things belong to you. And so we know your revealed will on the pages of scripture and we praise you and thank you for it. And we are going to hold tenaciously to that. And we're going to pursue that. And regardless of how difficult circumstances would be, we, are, we might even feel like a wineskin in the smoke, but yet we do not want to forget your commandments. But I pray, Lord, that we would lift up our soul to you and say that we might find our joy, our contentment in you, that we would also be content with what you're content with, and that we would hate the idea of complaining in our heart or soul against your providence. 
Lord, this is a blasphemous lie. You're not worthy of that kind of treatment. You're worthy of an entire created order expressing completely perfect contentment in you and in your wisdom and in your plan and in your purpose and in the path that you've ordained to get there. And so, Lord, we just pray that this theology of contentment would ground our lives so that regardless of circumstance, you'd be pleased, you'd be glorified, you'd be honored, and we'd have the privilege of experiencing a contentment that does not rest on circumstance, that our contentment would be as unchanging as you are. Thank you for always disposing of your providence and your sovereignty uh, according to your righteous and perfect will. In your name we pray. Amen.